Okay, I'm going to be talking about uh, um, an Australian perspective and um, I'm going to sort of reflect a bit upon Carl's presentation um, and I'm particularly focusing on what forms of intervention reliably produce positive outcomes which is a question of efficacy and um, how to deliver these interventions so they achieve positive outcomes which is a question of effectiveness. Two of the um, issues that Carl put up. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. And I'm also going to reflect upon work that um, we've done at the Centre for Community Child Health, particularly work that I've done with my colleague Mafanwi MacDonald, and the challenges we faced in answering these questions using standard research methodology and a progress report upon our current thinking. Um, and the, the work that I'm talking about particularly is um, in these reports. So we did two reports. This was um, res reviews of research on um, the best practices in um, uh, home visiting with vulnerable children. And what we found was, uh, we looked at the evidence, um, we found that the best programs were not always effective and even when they were they were only modestly effective and the indicators were that there were some other factors contributing to the success of interventions that were not um, reliably captured by randomised control trial studies. So we offered to do a second review for them and um, that review looked at the um, processes of service delivery. What's going on when you're delivering, how you deliver the services. And what we found there was um, that uh, the gen there was general support for the notion that process aspects of service delivery matter for outcomes and that what this indicates that evidence um, practice, not just the um, efficacy of programs or intervention, it's also the efficacy of the process that matters. The way in which services are delivered is important. Okay, so what I'm going to have a look at quickly, and these slides can be, will be made available, so if I shoot over some, I want to unpack evidence-based practice. I want to look at forms of fidelity. Um, I want to offer a framework um, for human service delivery and some conclusions. The issue of evidence-based practice, um, it, 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 this whole movement stresses the importance of program fidelity. So what's evidence-based practice? Um, it was originally defined as the conscientious use of current best evidence in making decisions. This is the medical definition. The same people a few years later broadened that definition to say that it's the combination of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. So three elements uh, are meant to be in there. And the three elements are um, that we've got the best research evidence, the use of interventions that have been proven to be effective. We've got clinical expertise uh, and we've got patient values, the unique preferences and concerns and expectations of the particular patient as being an important element. And when these three elements are integrated, clinicians and patients form a therapeutic alliance which optimises clinical outcomes. So there's, the, so there's a challenge for us. We've got three um, elements of evidence-based practice. Um, how are we to integrate those uh, into um, uh, so let's have a look at each, each of them and just what, briefly what they each tell us. So the best available research, I'm suggesting there are three ways in which we know about this and the first of these is the one that's usually taken to be the best way of doing it. The randomised control trials and the whole evidence hierarchy, which you'll be familiar with. I also think that the approach that Carl was talking about, Practice-based research syntheses or evidence-based kernels is another term used for them, is another way. And a, a third way are realist syntheses. All ways of establishing what is effective. Um, uh, and the, the whole business with randomised control trials and the evidence hierarchy, this is the usual criteria for judging the quality of evidence. We give precedence to systematic reviews of um, RCTs, they're the gold standard. 
But there are a number of problems with that whole approach, which I won't go into, um, including the fact that none of the available hierarchies actually address the question of how to incorporate those other two elements of what is supposed to be evidence-based practice. Where's the clinical evidence and where are patient values? So the overall conclusion from this, which I can't argue in detail, but is that we can't rely on evidence-based research alone in selecting evidence strategies. We've got to broaden the evidence base. Carl's practice-based research syntheses and the uh, evidence-based kernels um, approach uh, focus on the common elements shared by different effective programs rather than the efficacy of individual programs and Carl described how that works. So that's a source of knowledge for us about what works. Realist syntheses um, also, they adopt a, a wide range of evidence, not just randomised control trials, that seek to identify underlying causal mechanisms and explore how they work. So they're, what they're trying, to an this, trying to answer what works for whom under what circumstances rather than just what works. Randomised control trials don't tell us how the program works, only tells us that it works, and yet we need to know how it works. We're going to make it work properly. Um, so what do these different sources of evidence tell us about what evidence are efficacious? Um, well, there are many programs that have been identified. The general rule is the simpler and more focused they are, the more efficacious they are. Whole programs with complex elements to them are not as effective as simple ones. Short causal chains are better than long causal chains. Overall, even the most efficacious programs are only modestly effective, leave much of the variance explained. Um, but we've also identified a whole series of efficacious strategies, and Carl put up some of the ones that his group has actually um, identified. Um, so we do have a bag of tricks we can call upon. Um, which we can identify. Now, whether all of us in this room would identify the same ones or familiar with the best evidence is a question that we've got to address. But uh, now, what about what do we know about the effectiveness of programs? So, if you remember the Carl's definition, the effectiveness is about how it gets played out in real life settings, how we uh, how the how the these efficacious programs are actually used by practitioners. Um, so here we're into the business of having a look at effective processes. And there are different ways in which these have been identified. There's a common factors approach. This comes from the psychotherapy literature that I as a psychologist would draw upon. So this kind of um, literature, uh, what do therapists know about how people change? There's a common factors approach, common elements approach, and then there's also what we know about features of effective help giving. All of these cover the same kind of ground. They're talking about how we deliver services. The common factors approach, what this tells us is that psychotherapy um, works because um, of, not because of the unique contributions of any particular model, but because of a set of common factors that cut across all therapies. And there's considerable evidence to support the notion that the benefits of counselling and psychotherapy are derived from things like the strength of the therapeutic alliance rather than specific forms of therapy. Common elements approach is similar to that. Uh, Carl and his colleagues have looked at effective help giving strategies. Uh, I'll take the simple version of um, what they're um, finding. Um, and there's the technical knowledge that you have, which is important. There are the relational practices that you use, which are um, your active listening and compassion and empathy, etc. And then there's a participatory practices which refer to the way in which you provide parents with um, choices uh, and build their skills and so on. So those are common features of effective help giving. If you don't have those features, then your effective practices, your efficacious programs are less likely to be taken up and used. Um, so there are a number of, we can summarise a number of key uh, elements of effective um, services. They're relationship based, they involve partnerships, they target goals, the parents see as important. 
Uh, they provide parents with choices, they build parental competencies, they're non-stigmatising, they demonstrate cultural awareness and sensitivity and they maintain continuity of care. Those are the features of common elements of effective processes for delivering programs. Uh, and they appear to be particularly important for vulnerable families who appear to be less likely to make use of professional services that don't possess those qualities. Um, there is the issue of practice-based evidence as well. I won't go into this in much detail. There are several ways in which we can think about this. We can think about the whole notion of um, collective clinical expertise or collective expertise, which is the second element of evidence-based practice. And there's also the notion of the concurrent gathering of evidence during practice. In the early intervention um, field, the examples that we've got of collective expertise tend to appear in these kinds of documents from the Division of Early Childhood in the States, and there's a new um, one coming out um, this year. These are both evidence-based and represent a consensus of collective opinion about best practices. Um, uh, if we're talking about the concurrent gathering of evidence, this is work from psychotherapy which says that the way that you ensure that you are an effective practitioner is you get constant feedback. Uh, if you get constant feedback you will dramatically increase your effectiveness your, and the take up of your services. Um, so you gather evidence of the effectiveness of your practice as you are delivering it and you use this evidence to modify your practice. And what does that mean? You don't develop an um, a, um, individual family support plan that, that is for a six month period and then stick to that rigidly. You're constantly working on it and modifying and checking it whether it's uh, working or not. And there's a body of work um, called Feedback Informed Treatment, which has got some useful tools, um, I think, for us there. The third element of evidence-based practice is values, outcomes and beliefs. Um, I just had values and outcomes to start with, so I've added beliefs in in the light of the evidence that Carl is um, presenting us with, which says that professionals' beliefs and parent beliefs are an important part of this process. But values the patient values, the unique preferences, concerns and expectations. Um, and values-based care is a blending of the values of the service user and the, and the professional, thus, thus creating a true as opposed to a tokenistic partnership. So it's not just sharing of knowledge, it's also sharing of values which becomes important in the partnership. The consistent evidence that services are less effective if they don't uh, address the issues that the clients see as important if they don't use strategies that the clients are happy and able to use. There's just a profoundly important um, statement. If we don't do that, then our services don't, are less effective. And the whole beliefs issues, parental and professional beliefs play an important mediating role is the point that Carl is making. We don't have direct effects on kids. It's always mediated, in this case, by professional beliefs. Parental beliefs are belief in the intervention, which is a kind of placebo effect, and belief in, in their personal ability to implement it as planned. What we're trying to do is build their, build the parental capacity, their belief in their own ability to do that. Professional beliefs are beliefs in the efficacy of the intervention, which I take to be what Carl's talking about with social validity, and belief in the parent's ability to implement the plan. We have to believe in that. If you don't believe in that, that will be known by the parent and they'll be less likely to be able to do it. So we've got these three form, three elements of evidence-based practice. I think there are three forms of fidelity we need to be talking about. Um, and the, we generally only hear about one form of fidelity and this is the implementation science angle that's recently um, being uh, championed. And the argument here is the reason that we don't have as good effects as we should for evidence-based programs is that we don't implement them faithfully enough. So we've got an implementation science movement which focuses on program fidelity, 
faithfulness to the delivery of a particular program. Um, I think we need an expanded <coughs> idea here. I would argue that we need um, uh, that evidence-informed practice contains three elements. It's got programs or evidence-based interventions. It's got processes, effective forms, um, and it's got values. And that corresponding to these are three forms of fidelity, all of which are measurable. Program fidelity is concerned with what's delivered, ensuring the faithful delivery of proven programs or strategies according to the original design. Process is to do with how services that are delivered and making sure that they're delivered in ways that we are known to be effective in engaging with families and so on. And values fidelity, we need to ensure that the focus of service and the method of service delivery are consistent with the values and choices of our families. All of those are measurable um, and we should be measuring them. And they're not hard to measure, I don't think. Um, we need to keep these things simple. OK, so I'm going to present you with a framework that incorporates those elements. Um, and uh, it needs to align program content and methodology with client values. Uh, we need to be attuned and responsive to the views and circumstances of clients and engage them as partners. We need to use a purposeful process of joint decision making in identifying goals. We need to be able to offer parents the choice of a range of evidence-based strategies and program modules to address their goals, and we need to monitor all of this. The givens for this model are, I'm taking, this, these are my assumptions, that the outcome we're aiming at is that the, what we want for young children with disabilities and developmental uh, problems is to be able to participate meaningfully in their home, early childhood education and care and community environments. So it's participation, meaningful participation. And that the role of our services is to, is to ensure that parents or other key care caregivers are able to provide young children with experiences and opportunities that promote the acquisition and use of competencies which enable them to, to participate. So those are the two assumptions. Uh, the resources that we've got, we've got teams and we've got um, what the family and the community, what strengths they already have. So if we draw a simple program logic thing, starting from the child is able to participate meaningfully or ending with that, and starting with that, what's, what happens in between? The first step is the relationship building and help giving. That, the, that process element of our service is profoundly important. Um, the next bit um, is this business about parental beliefs. We, we need to give them skills, um, so we're going to change their skills as well. But beliefs and skills are joined in a, a continuous loop. We don't have to change parents' beliefs first in order to do things. Does you, do you change behaviours in order to change people's ideas about themselves or is it the other way around? They interact with one another. So in the process of giving people skills, we're also working on their ideas about themselves and what they are telling them. This is what good teachers do with kids. And we also need to mobilise family resources and that too is part of a loop. If we do those things, then we will enable the parents to provide a different environmental experience for the child. That will um, uh, enable the child to develop functional skills, which will enable them to participate. And we can unpack all of that, but that's the, that's the uh, simplified model of what it looks like. Um, and if we were to break it up into um, a finer detail. So here's an integrated service delivery framework. We're going to start with the um, relationship building with the key qualities of attunement, responsiveness and authenticity. And our next job is to identify what the things are important for that family and to agree upon those, making sure that those issues are most salient to and valued by uh, the families. Um, we, our next is when we switch to strategies. This is where you'll notice in this that these first three things have got nothing to do with programs. 
We haven't started talking about programs and strategies yet. This is where we start talking about them. But the strategy selection process is partly a, a matter of asking the parents what they know already and partly a matter of um, bringing to the table stuff we know, which is our bag of tricks that we were talking about before. Um, we then agree upon the strategies. They have to be acceptable to and usable to clients, so this is your action plan. Um, we then enter that implementation phase, and here we are continuously checking with families as to whether it's working. Are we still on track? Is this still important to you? This is where we get that constant feedback. Um, so we're process monitoring. Are the strategies working as intended? And of course, we also have to look at whether they're having the impact that we want. So that's got to be built in. And at a certain point, we're going to have a review. Have we achieved our outcomes? This is a cyclical process. What we're trying to do is to support the parents in providing a threshold level of experiences for their child that ensures that the child is actually developing functional skills. It doesn't have to be perfect after all. Um, I don't want to ask everyone in the, anyone in this room who thinks they are a perfect person, to, perfect parent to put up your hand. Nobody is able to do this perfectly, so, and certainly our parents aren't, and you don't need to. You need a good enough level. Um, um, I can go through all of this and unpack it, and I'm not going to because that's happening. <laughs> and, um, um, and I wasn't intending to anyway. This is to show you what this might look like if we unpacked it. We can unpack this and turn it into a complete handbook on how to do early intervention. And dis discriminating at all points between what are processes or how we deliver the service, what are the content stuff of it, and what are the beliefs and values. Um, so all of these can be um, dealt with in that kind of way. Um, so the conclusions, evidence-based or evidence-informed practice is multidimensional rather than unidimensional as usually conceptualised and to ensure the efficacy and effectiveness of our services we need to attend to three forms of fidelity um, and a service delivery framework that integrates these three core elements I think could be useful in helping guide um, our practices. Thank you. <laughs>